Um, I am Jennifer Miller coming to you from Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. And the first speaker I would like to bring to you is Ruth. Thank you. I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, so uh, what I would like to um, share with folks today briefly is um, work that I've been uh, doing in collaboration with DORA, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, Declaration on Research Assessment, on creating a rubric, recognizing how we can um, not just think about individual interventions towards increasing assessment and equity in academic assessment, but also think at the capability level and at institutions. So I'm going to share predominantly um, the nature of the rubric, um, but also kind of what is it that spurred it and what kind of helped, how, got us to think about this in the first place. Um, so this idea of building institutional capacity rather than focusing on individual interventions, um, part of the reason that that felt really important is because if you think about it, um, interventions, whether it's different ways to assess um, incoming um, new hires or to assess people as they're moving up, um, sometimes individual interventions can work quite well, but unless the institution itself, whether it's a university or another academic research institution, um, can't necessarily keep a persistent approach towards doing that well, and sometimes you may just get lucky, right? Certain interventions may help, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're building this capacity more broadly. So this idea of looking at institutional conditions and infrastructure was kind of a first principle. Um, we also recognized heavily that all institutions are extremely different not just geographically, but in terms of where people focus and the nature of what assessment even means in some cases. Um, and so this sense of different kind of institutional maturity is something that we wanted to make sure that we addressed. Um, we also wanted to make sure that there was enough um, sort of a capacity to gauge and support. So as we're thinking about different use cases, I uh, wanted you to keep in mind, it can be about establishing a baseline that can be useful, um, but also retrospectively seeing what has worked is part of what we're interested in doing with this rubric. Um, won't talk about this in great detail, but this has basically been sort of work over uh, almost a year and a half at this point, very international, making sure that we're getting um, a lot of participatory and iterative feedback along the way uh, in order to make sure that it's relevant and useful for many, many different kinds of institutions. And we're now um, in this latter half towards the right where we're socializing and testing um, and ideally even getting um, additional translations and workshops so that we can make sure it's quite useful. Um, so the rubric itself is, um, as one recognizes from a rubric, kind of two distinct dimensions. Um, the first dimension in terms of where it is that we're focusing are these five, what we call space dimensions, um, these different uh, ways that we can think about how assessment is important, but more importantly, what are the ways in which we can uh, assess the institutions themselves and see, are they building this sort of institutional muscle to do assessment quite well? Um, so in some cases, for example, it may be around aligning on um, certain standards standards and definitions, that can itself be a barrier making sure that certain assessment processes are stitched into policies and mechanics. So we're not relying just on individuals. Um, building in accountability is actually quite important. Um, if you have people who are sort of always passing the buck or if it always feels like, oh, that's somebody else's job, um, making sure that we're actually sort of walking the walk as well as talking the talk um, and building that in both informally and formally. Um, finally, we realized that culture, of course, is what helps to support uh, sort of any kind of good behavior. So looking top to bottom at an organization. Um, and then finally, making sure that there are feedback loops um, and that we're evaluating the assessment itself and seeing how capabilities are being built and how successfully that is being uh, sort of supported. Um, our other dimension is recognizing, again, in this interest of looking across different maturity levels. In some cases, and to be clear, there's no good or bad, right or wrong, some institutions are at a very early stage. And so looking at more foundational capabilities is really where they're at, and that's the right place to focus. In other cases, institutions might be already expanding upon good practices. Um, and in other cases, they're even at the level where they're scaling, right? They're taking good practices and seeing how they work more broadly across divisions, across um, sort of different functions within, within the institution or university. Um, so if we think about, this is kind of a snapshot of the rubric categories. 
Um, and as we think about kind of capturing all of these, just to sort of double down on that point about the different levels of maturity, um, one of the things that we've been exploring and testing with institutions too is kind of giving, even though this is not a prescriptive way to move through these different levels, um, ensuring that uh, institutions have a way to think about what does it look like um, as you become more mature, as you may be focusing on different things. Um, because of course, the idea of trying to do everything all at once is almost a guaranteed recipe for not doing anything well. Um, so this idea of focusing very specifically before moving on. Um, so that's it from my perspective. I did want to make sure, and I will share this in the chat as well, some contact information if anyone is interested in learning more or getting further involved. Thank you, Ruth. And now we'd like to hear from Christina. Great. Hi there, everyone. I'm Christina Drummond, and I'm the Program Officer for the Open Access eBook Usage Data Trust effort. Previous sessions here at Force have showcased efforts working to illustrate scholarly impact, yet for open access books, impact storytelling requires data from a vast array of public and private institutions. To bring together usage data to holistically represent an OA author's impact, libraries, publishers, platforms, and services all struggle to combine this usage data from across the internet. This is where our Open Access eBook Usage Data Trust comes into the picture. Making sure that such usage data curation can be easier for these open access book stakeholders. So today I'm honored to update you on how a remarkable team of six PIs and over two dozen advisors um, with input from over a hundred constituents over five continents have been working together to understand and address the challenges to open access book analytics. Over the past two years of support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, our effort has engaged a global OA book community to document the usage data supply chain and understand how different stakeholders rely on usage data for strategy and decision making. Through interviews, focus groups, and by piloting a proof of concept open source usage data analytics platform, we learned about the challenges staff face when producing OA book reporting and analytics. Over the next few minutes, I'll highlight a few key project outputs and our plans for the next few years. First up, I show this image of our open access book usage data supply chain. Michael Clark and Laura Ritchie produced this report for us based on interviews to document how usage data flows across stakeholders in the scholarly communications lifecycle. You can see how the generated usage data on the right travels through library management systems, book aggregators, publishing platforms, and repositories, which in turn then generate the structured usage data reports for the publishers, libraries, scholars, and funders on the left. You also see how publishers and libraries share this burden of combining multiple structured usage data reports. The report here shows, um, shown also contains the image and goes into more detail on the challenges that these organizations face when compiling usage data from multiple data sources. Second, through facilitated stakeholder workshops, Kevin Hawkins and I uncovered how different stakeholders rely on usage data for decision making. Applications of OA usage data are wide ranging from informing collection development or editorial strategy to evaluating promotional campaigns and informing print editions. Publishers and libraries clearly wish to leverage OA book usage analytics for OA program operations. Yet across the scholarly communications ecosystem, organizations have to allocate time and expertise to combine and put counter compliant reports in context alongside related data and non counter compliant web analytics. A third way we learned about usage data needs was by working directly with four university presses, one OA publishing network, and a commercial publisher to leverage their usage data to prototype dashboards and cross-platform benchmarks. This research and development allowed our Curtin University-based technical team led by Cameron Nealon and Lucy Montgomery to develop open source code and pilot usage data processing approaches. The work surfaced that despite the existence of book data and usage data reporting standards, such as Onyx and Counter, Standards adoption is not universal, nor is all usage data openly available. We had to consider how to foster trusted data processing and stewardship at scale across global public and private usage data creators, which brought us back to the importance of trust. Trust in data security for data sharing, trust in data processing algorithms, and trust that our effort would do no harm to those providing usage data, to those relying on the aggregated data usage feeds, um, and those who are reflected in the data. We also researched models for data intermediaries. While clarifying our mission and vision for a global usage data trust, we surfaced the international data space framework um, and its associated resources as a way to support this trusted community governed usage data brokerage. Key to this IDS model is that 
connectivity and partnership framework. It's not a system to replace all others. Instead, it formalizes data sharing agreements and the processes across stakeholders that streamline data stewardship and exchange with uh, and across existing organizations in a data ecosystem. And so our R&D has been com uh, complemented with legal research, preliminary budget modeling and community governance development. We thankfully discovered early that the forthcoming European Data Governance Act will require neutral data trusts that broker public and private data in the EU to run independent of any metrics or analytic services. So accordingly, we are separating the dashboarding service work that we've created so far from the data trust effort going forward. So in its next phase, the open access ebook Usage Data Trust, or OAEBU, um, will develop usage data governance and processing rules while piloting this IDS framework um, and the elements therein to support cross-platform usage data sharing and processing upstream. Uh, and also to act as a messenger service, if you will, for the metric service providers downstream. Then as one of our metric services out there, the usage data dashboard pilot will branch off as a demonstration project further developed by OAPEN and PIs at Curtin University in Edgecopia. Let me know if you'd like to participate in any effort, uh, in either effort going forward. With that, thank you. Thank you, Christina. And now Gunther. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kuhn Dreisenbach. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Jamie Publications, which is a small publisher. And I'm going to talk about Plan P, Transform to Open Science, which is our product, if you will, for institutions and funders. And uh, the keywords I'm going to uh, mention here and which I want you to associate with Plan P are they all start with P, protocols, preprints, peer review innovations, OA publication, and promotion and tenure metrics uh, innovation. Um, just a few words about Jamia Publications. Um, we were founded 20 years ago. It has academic roots. I'm actually a, a former professor in medical informatics. I created the company and the journal, uh, which um, was the um, the, the first journal we published, the Journal of Medical Internet Research, I, I founded that more as a um, response to the current publishing system and out of frustration uh, that you know publishing is broken. And so we are mission driven. We are publishing now 30 journals uh, in the area of medicine, uh, focuses on knowledge translation to different audiences, including patients. But the secondary goal here is also to re-engineer scholarly publishing. And uh, we were open access from the beginning. We are the co-founder of OASPA, which is the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association. And uh, we are now, by publication output, the, the leading open access publisher in Canada. And we see ourselves not just as a publisher, but, but as a disruptor and perhaps even tech company. So in 99, so in 2019, we, we celebrated our 20th anniversary and in the editorial to our 20th anniversary theme issue, um, we, I reflected on, on the future of, of Jamie publications and um, the, the tone here is really that we focus on, we have to focus on open science. And we also announced the uh, creation of, an, of a new overlay journal an overlay journal, as you probably know, is a journal that sits on top of preprint servers and does rapid peer review of preprints. And that the name of that journal is JMAX, uh, which we have launched. And um, that uh, that journal, um, or it's actually a journal series, uh, publishes um, peer reviews of preprints and also the, the final version of record of, of the preprints. And it's, it's, to our knowledge, this is the first PubMed indexed overlay journal. Uh, so what is plan P? Plan P is our framework and, and plan to achieve 100% open access. It is compatible with plan S, which probably doesn't uh, require an explanation here. Um, but just um, briefly, plan S is, is um, the, the European plan to transform to open access. And it actually puts pure open access publishers into a very uh, difficult situation because suddenly the legacy publishers get money from libraries, researchers are encouraged to publish and 
in, in legacy journals and uh, pure open access publishers are left out of these deals. And that's why we formulate a plan P kind of as a response of, of our product, what, what we can offer. Plan U is, is the simple idea that uh, preprints, if you publish everything as preprint, you can achieve 100% open access. But what's missing here is obviously the peer review component, and that's where Plan P comes in. You can also see Plan P as an accelerator for open science implementation. So preprints and protocols and so on are all, all part of this ecosystem which we are creating. Um, the ecosystem itself is a collaboration between open science friendly institutions, funders, societies, peer review services, and uh, journals. And um, we have come up, sorry, also with a quite innovative business model where um, the cost of publication is basically shared between institutions and funders, um, modeled after the University of California um, model. And it's also an innovation uh, to experiment with new forms of peer reviews. And it's a plan to re reform research assessment while being fully compatible with the current impact factor centric system. Um, this slide summarizes some of the players here. So we have institutions, we have funders. We are currently mainly uh, selling, trying to sell this, this uh, plan to institutions. Um, we are um, signing agreements with them, which we call also transform to open science agreements. Um, those institutions give us money and um, we basically distribute this, these funds uh, to peer review services with whom we collaborate. Um, we are working with preprint servers. We have our own preprint server, Jamie Preprints, but we also tap into other preprint servers, for example, MedArchive, BioArchive, et cetera. Um, we have developed a, a prospecting platform and a manuscript marketplace, which is a technical innovation that aggregates um, preprints from a variety of preprint servers and, and also channels them uh, to peer review services, also aggregates existing peer reviews from peer review services. And um, we also, uh, we, we work with uh, what we call plan peer compatible journals. Um, these are journals which support this workflow, which is a preprint first workflow, preprint, then review, then curate, which means first, uh, first the review takes place, and then uh, the curation aspect is basically publishing the version of record in a Plan P compatible journal. Thank you for this message. It's been great to learn about this. Um, if you want to quickly drop the follow up information, and we'll get ready to hear from Jeff. Yeah, this is uh, my contact information. If you want to learn more, plant.science. Thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, thanks so much. Uh, I am Jeff Pooley. I am a professor of media and communication at Muhlberg College. And I'm also the director of a small um, scholar-led nonprofit publisher called mediastudies.press. And I'm uh, talking about the idea of an open reader. And I wanna illustrate it with an example, um, the one you see before you. And uh, I could try to drop that in the chat, um, uh, which I'm, I'm not finding at the moment. So I will be sure to in a moment. Uh, the uh, idea itself, if you're curious about it, you can read a, an article off of the um, main table of contents, which just goes into some of the history of the, the reader itself, this um, venerable um, university course reader concept, which really goes back at least 250 years. Um, but let me, yeah, I do see the chat now and I'm gonna go ahead and drop the URL in. Um, and just to uh, describe this, I'm gonna go ahead and create a pub here, uh, the open, open reader. And the first basic uh, element of what it entails is um, a collection of works available on the open web. The second fundamental piece is that it is selected and ordered with university courses in mind. Uh, 
And the key piece that, as I've envisioned it, and as we're working at mediastudies.press to develop additional um, open reader examples, is that the readers are comprised of openly licensed materials, which are hosted, but also outbound links for items that are copyrighted, but that are still available on the open web. So um, what I'm gonna do is just jump back and show you a little bit about it. First, um, it is online only, of course, and just like any other um, book that we publish, it has an ISBN and a digital object identifier. But what I thought I would do is take you through uh, a couple of the types of articles that appear. So one example would be this article in the, on, on the Zoom gaze, and it's from a publication called Real Life um, that we have permission to reprint from. And this is all on the PubPub platform that MIT, um, that it kind of MIT linked. It's from the Knowledge Futures Group um, and grew out of a media lab collaboration with, um, uh, with uh, the MIT Press. And the, uh, so you have the, the link to the published version on the open web, but we have permission to reprint the rest of it. Um, and it's uh, licensed um, and it has a kind of outbound link at the bottom. That would be one example of an article type. A second one would be the case in which there is an, uh, an article on the open web, but that is copyrighted. And so we would include the first you know, couple of paragraphs, but then with an outbound link, and an indication that there's free access. And the student presumably would follow the link out to uh, the article. So we've also included a third type, which would be public domain works. And here you have um, you know, William James 1892 Psychology, the briefer course, and an excerpt from it um, on the self, as you might guess. And it's reprinted here, but of course the outbound link is to the um, internet archives version or one of its versions of the manuscript. And then the, the I guess the penultimate um, version is uh, an academic article that bears an open access license like CCBY or something like that. Um, and, uh, and so here it's reprinted. Um, and they, I just wanted to point out a couple of potential limitations. Um, the first is that certain articles, you could call it a kind of fifth type, have um, uh, metered paywalls. So, you know, they, they're included here, like a New Yorker article that, that um, students could receive a barrier to. Another challenge is annotation. Students don't often realize that there's a PDF download option. There is a native feature in PubPub to do comments, but it's often missed by students. Um, but in any event, let me uh, again uh, make sure that I am um, reachable. I will throw my email address into the chat if anyone has any questions or is interested in further reading about the model. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. I will be following up on that immediately, but um, also now looking forward to hearing from Hannah. Now I'm unmuted. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Cahoon, a doctoral candidate at UT Austin, and I study knowledge infrastructures and science. And today I'll be sharing some results from the interviews and observation that I've done for my dissertation research, which is a study of the use, non-use, and development of a platform for open science. And first, I want to acknowledge a basic premise for this talk, that public engagement with academic research is going to increase. Recent concerns around scientific misinformation means that there's an active push to increase public involvement with science. President Biden's administration recently advised department heads that federal funding opportunities should be oriented towards engaging with the public and giving them access to scientific research. And this will be done to increase trust in science. We already have digital platforms to make science open to the public in a fair way and to make it more rigorous. And these are platforms like the OSF, the site for my dissertation study. The OSF is a free web platform for scientists to share their research. It's developed by the Center for Open Science or COS. And scientists can host their research materials, data, registrations, manuscripts there. 
And some key features of the platform are that there's free file storage, anyone can sign up, and there's good SEO, which is fertile ground for spammers. And since I started observation and interviews this summer, there's been a notification banner at the top of all OSF domains, letting users know who to contact if their account was falsely flagged as spam. And that banner's up because of the legal content like Mortal Kombat and Wonder Woman 1984. And at first that made me laugh, uh, mostly the absurdity of fantasy martial arts occupying rack space next to my interview protocols. But the employees who maintain and develop the OSF have been spending months trying to clean up and prevent spam. And at one point earlier this year, user reported issues related to spam increased so dramatically that one member said that the number of support tickets was terrifying. And without the extra help that they got, they'd be living and breathing Zendesk tickets. And it's not so easy to deal with because even though live streams get returned in the results for watch online HD, so does legitimate content like the registration here in the middle of the screen. OSF developers have been considering two approaches to reducing spam, verifying users and verifying content, and both have presented values conflicts. Open science is closely affiliated with inclusivity, but restricting its practice to certain users can perpetuate the issues that it hopes to address. And like the Biden administration said, open science's popularity has been driven by a desire for rigorous research. Users visit the OSF so that they can present polished work to their peers and the public. And developers worry that spam projects on that same platform will decrease its value. But at the same time, COS doesn't want to be arbitrating the legitimacy of OSF content. And they recognize that when something shows up on the platform, it gives the guise of legitimacy no matter what. Spam is pretty easy to identify right now, but it is time consuming to fix. And it's not the kind of work that OSF developers have special funds to work on. So another conflict, this time between funders and the platform, is that spam mitigation is paid for through general funds rather than the special grants that fund things like feature development. But I'd argue that it's of just as much importance to spend time thinking and planning for because it's not gonna stay easy for long. One interviewee told me that it comes back to that trust factor of, is this OSF place? Am I gonna find useful information here? Or am I just gonna see a lot of garbage? Keeping the garbage to a minimum will get harder. For instance, they've already seen AI generated manuscripts uploaded. Other users reported that AI generated content, relying on users to flag spam is one approach that COS is using to identify and remove spam. But when does content moderation end and peer review begin? As our installed base, platforms like the OSF are going to be supporting the future of open science and public engagement with science. But the professional scientific community has a skill set that allows us to evaluate material even in the absence of peer review. I've observed and heard about the substantial work COS has done to deal with spam responsibly. If we want trustworthy content available to our peers and the public, effective spam mitigation is going to be and will be part of enacting open science. And that'll mean that we need to examine our budgets and our mechanisms for evaluating legitimate scientific contributions, for conveying rigor, for accepting participation, and for ensuring equity. Rather than leaving it to the platforms to decide alone how to moderate scientific content, I think our community should be a vocal part of establishing the new procedures for managing what does and doesn't count. That'll be important for our professional knowledge production, but also as the boundaries of the scientific community expand, we need to consider how our values and procedures are conveyed to a lay audience. Thank you. Uh, I can answer questions in the chat or my email is shared on the screen. And I'd also like to thank my study participants, some of whom will be sharing their data when analysis is concluded. So, thanks. Thank you, Hannah. As our conference blogger, that topic is near to my heart. <laughs> now, uh, Micah, are you here and um, ready to present? Thank you. Here and ready. Yes. Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you, Jennifer and Hannah. Very interesting project. Uh, looking forward to hearing more. Uh, I, for those keen observers, you'll notice uh, that I did present yesterday with uh, more beard and, and sleeves, but here I am again uh, representing a different organization. Uh, I'm presenting the Accelerating the Social Impact of Research, which is a pilot program of the Association of Research Libraries, for which I'm serving as a visiting program officer. 
the program, uh, which I'll call ACER, uh, A-S-I-R, throughout the uh, presentation, is meant to convene research libraries who are interested in increasing our activity in open research and scholarship, hopefully toward the end of um, better uh, indicating and illustrating the social impact of the research uh, at, with the library as a, as a mediator. You see the list of participating organizations for our first pilot uh, on the screen. And we're looking at this at, at various scales, uh, campus administrators, our faculty on campus, uh, department chairs, college deans, and then more importantly, um, the community inward. How, how can we be responsive to our community? Some of the guiding questions for us are how can libraries strategically invest our advocacy and programs to align with shifts in research, some of which we've already heard from the various presentations uh, in this panel and earlier today. Um, and then also what's the opportunity space uh, in the middle of open research and scholarship, um, community engagement, and societal impact. It feels like there's something in the middle of there and that the library might have a role to play. Some of the goals of the program are, are really just to understand the landscape, um, to establish deeper relationships. Um, a, a pet peeve of mine is that uh, libraries are often mentioned as a as a partner in uh, in this kind of work, um, but not often always visible. Kind of falling under the uh, the banner of um, you know universities, but I think often libraries have a different perspective. So uh, to that end, we're examining specific opportunities for libraries to move within this landscape. And then some of the output will be hopefully some sort of a framework, uh, an idea for what libraries can do to activate that action. Uh, we kicked off the program in August, and you can see a, a brief outline here of, of work that we've done so far. Across the bottom there are really just um, uh, uh, events or uh, things that happened during the course of our time. Uh, Open Science Week in September, of course, the UNESCO recommendation just a couple of weeks ago in November. Um, but hopefully where we're uh, going with our program is building toward action over this timeline. I uh, did a brief survey with a very small group, nine research libraries, but you can see that the the way that most of us think about our, our support for accelerating social impact of research is through expertise, through the people that are that work in libraries that can work with researchers or faculty to uh, to move um, academic knowledge into the public sphere. Uh, the things I'm really interested about um, uh, for, uh, in the survey here is that zero percent on vision development. I think that that's a uh, a role that um, I'd like to see more more li libraries uh, involved in. Uh, developed a working model uh, to try to start to think about what we might do. Um, this won't be surprising to anyone, but I uh, um, use alliteration to help myself remember things. So I think we should be aware um, at a mega level, uh, advocating at a macro, advancing at the meso level with, through our professional associations, and then activating at, uh, um, at, at local or regional levels. Our, again, our guiding question, how can we impact blank through support or advancement of open research? Really curious about the framework of knowledge mobilization, um, validation of, of new modes of knowledge production and research communication specifically. You can read some about uh, what I've been thinking about this. I put a link in the chat just a second ago, but uh, my, my three big ideas are on the screen there in this blog post titled Defining Social Impact. Happy to talk about that more later. And the opportunities that uh, modes that we're thinking about um, doing this work is uh, through community advocacy and infrastructure with some examples there on the right. Uh, and I just want to um, call out that when I uh, think about infrastructure, I think much more about people, time and resources than technology and tools and platforms. Finally, in summary, uh, this is uh, the accelerating the social impact of research program from the Association of Research Libraries. It's a pilot concluding in January with uh, some follow-up work after that. Uh, and we're really looking toward um, creating action toward uh, advocacy, community, and infrastructure. Thanks for listening. Uh, my email is on there. I'll also drop it in the chat in just a second. Thank you. And now um, our next presenter will be Daniel. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Just getting things set up here. 
Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and uh, thanks to the force organizers for the opportunity to present today. And Jennifer Miller, thank you for moderating the session. Uh, I'm Dan Kipnis. I'm the Life Sciences Librarian at Rowan University, and I'll, present, I'll be presenting today on some preliminary survey results from academic librarians and biology professors on teaching and using PIRA websites. My research colleague, Dr. Stephanie Spielman, is an assistant professor in the Biological Sciences Department at Rowan University. She's unable to attend today as she is teaching this afternoon, so I'll be uh, presenting for both of us. Rowan University is a recently classified R2 public research university with two medical schools, an allopathic and osteopathic medical schools, and we're approximately 20,000 students. Rowan is located in southern New Jersey, uh, 30 miles southeast of Philadelphia in the United States. We will quickly explain our project, our methods, and a few select findings, and hopefully we'll leave time for questions at the very end of the hour. So we define a uh, pirate or a shadow website or portal, uh, a place where academic papers are available without the permission of the copyright owner. Two common ones you've probably heard of include Sci-Hub and LibGen. We sent our survey out to various librarian listservs, as well as we targeted top 10 journals in the fields of computational and biology to correspond. Here are some of our preliminary findings. I see here more females and males. 39 age group generated the most responses. The majority of responses uh, respondents were affiliated with research institutions and the majority of the responses were from librarians with a good sampling of professors. The majority of responses were also affiliated in the natural sciences. Here, we do want you to note that the totals are higher as we allowed for multiple selections and did receive responses from various disciplines. Sci-Hub, as you can imagine, is known by both librarians and professors among the four different pirate portals. The other three portals were much less well-known among the respondents. And lastly, for those who responded, if they use the portals, very few librarians use them with the majority not using pirate websites, while professors showed a tendency towards using the pirate sites always, most of the time, about half of the time, and sometimes. We invite you to follow along as we continue to analyze our findings uh, using the following GitHub link, and our goal is to public findings in the year in a peer review trial. In the interim, we welcome your questions and Dr. Spielman is available as well on Twitter. Thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. Our next presentation will be from Jody. Hi there. It is great to be at um, uh, Force 11. It's been a, um, a, a few years. And um, today I wanna to talk about a project I've been running with uh, funding from the Alpha P Sloan Foundation. Um, and um, this is really about collaboration and standards development to reduce the inadvertent spread of retracted science. Before I got into this area, I didn't know what retraction was. So I wanna start by um, telling you that it's about correcting the literature and alerting readers to articles that contain seriously flawed or erroneous content or data so that the findings and conclusions can't be relied on. And um, COPE, who, who make these guidelines, the Committee on Publication Ethics, say that prompt retraction should minimize the number of researchers who cite the erroneous work, act on its findings, or draw incorrect conclusions. Um, unfortunately, that's not what happens in practice. Uh, there was a great investigative journalist um, um, piece in, um, in science this January, looking in the case of COVID-19, there were um, 
two articles, one published in The Lancet, um, the other in the New England Journal of Medicine, the surgosphere retractions, they were alive in the literature for about a month and um, quickly retracted. At this point, they each have over a thousand citations. Now, it's not just the numbers of citations that matter, but also what those say. And so the, um, the work that Charles Pillar did in investigating this was to look at a sample of 200 citations um, at the point that he was, um, was, was pulling the data um, that were um, citations after the retractions. He concluded that over half inappropriately cited the retracted articles. Now, that sounds really awful, but in fact, 50% in this space is fantastic. It means half the people were, when they were citing, were aware of the retraction and were, um, you know, maybe mentioning the articles instead of, instead of using them. Um, in um, larger sets of data, I've done database-wide research um, looking at biomedical articles, and it's about 6% of, of people who are intentionally citing and showing awareness of when they're doing these post-retraction citations. The other 94% do not show awareness. And when we look at what those look like, they just look like normal, here is some fact that I'm going to cite to some piece of literature, right? what you would sort of expect. Um, and that's really problematic. Um, people have been observing this for 30 years. And um, the challenge is that, it, um, that, that it's continued and there, there are lots of contributing factors. Um, is the retraction visible on the publisher website? How did the metadata get to the databases that people are looking at? Um, but fundamentally, we have to solve this problem. Um, and so with um, this Sloan funded project, I gathered a group of people from across scholarly communication to figure out what could we do. This is the advisory board. Um, all in all, we um, interviewed 47 people across different roles, had a three-part online workshop um, last October and November that gathered about 70 people all, all together. Um, there's a literature review um, and a bibliography I can share that, that's got that information and the citation analysis that I showed you some, some results from. We came up with four recommendations. Um, and these are things that I hope that folks from, from Force 11 can take on board and think about how to um, help move forward with. One is to um, develop um, a systematic cross-industry approach to ensure that information is publicly available um, about uh, retracted papers. Um, second, there needs to be a taxonomy of um, what is what are the classifications. People look very deeply into the reasons for retraction, but this is talking about you know when should something be a withdrawal as opposed to um, you know replacing the article in place and um, you know retract and replace sort of thing. Um, then um, there need to be best practices for coordinating the retraction process, and in this process. Um, uh, there's there's a, um, a, a report from uh, Clue, which is looking at collaboration between um, research institutions and, um, and publishing, and, and that's a great place to look for more guidance on what sorts of things can be done. Um, and there's a need also to educate stakeholders about um, the publication correction processes. It's a whole continuum, right? Retraction is one end, but there's all sorts of correction mechanisms. And that, I think in this community, it may be something we're, we're quite aware of, but across uh, scholarly publishing, um, all of the, the, the multiple different, different groups of, of authors and users, I don't think that that's, uh, there's a, enough awareness. Um, so um, uh, I also wanna tell you one thing that's fantastic that came from this is there is a MISO group that, is getting started to, to work on it. Um, and, um, and, and fundamentally, uh, that's gonna try to address this problem. And um, so, so keep, uh, keep an eye out and I'd be happy to talk to folks more about these things. Thank you, Jody. Um, look forward to further conversations about that. Really appreciate your, your presentation. Our next talk will come from Misha. All right, uh, can you guys see me, see me? All good, great. Um, so hello everybody, I'm Misha Teplitsky. Um, this is joint work with Eamon, Michael, and Green. Uh, it's about everyone's favorite topic, citations. Um, the, um, let's see if I can advance the slides. 
So the motivation um, for this uh, study comes from, um, you know, the wide use of citations as a measure of influence, right? People in practice often take those as equivalent. The normative view, you know, kind of long old standing literature is that, you know, quality gives you influence and citations just kind of reflect that influence. Um, but of course, there is kind of decades long literature arguing that citations are very different types. Um, and in particular, for our purposes, we'll focus on what we might call their influence intensity, how much they influenced the author's research choices. So we're going to define influence in this somewhat uh, concrete but narrow way. Um, and accordingly, citations then can be of different sort of influence int intensity. Some of them are substantive. They had influenced author a lot. Some of them are rhetorical. They may serve useful functions, but they don't uh, denote influence. And so if we divide citations this way, then, you know, a more proper way to measure how influential something is is to sum up how many substantive citations it has, right? So, so far, nothing too crazy, I, I hope. Um, and um, one kind of uh, untested um, but intuitive view is that highly cited papers will attract a lot of citations, but a lot of those will be rhetorical in nature. We might call this persuasion by name dropping. Um, and if that's the case, then highly cited papers might not actually be all that much more influential than other papers, right? A lot of their citations are rhetorical. And so this is kind of a longstanding, kind of untested threat to a lot of bibliometric practice. Um, so the research question we'll pose in the study is whether highly or lightly cited papers attract different types of citations and why. Uh, we'll study this question with a large scale survey. Um, that ended up having way more responses than I ever uh, uh, optimistically hoped for. So we ended up getting um, randomly sampling authors, um, a lot of detail into kind of quirks into how this was done, can talk about it another time perhaps, but um, we ended up uh, receiving responses from about 10,000 authors from all around the world. And the authors provide us with um, information about specific referencing decisions. So. We would ask them about a specific citation they made, and they would tell us how much it influenced them, et cetera. Um, in addition, we embedded an experiment in this um, survey that I'll show in a second that helps us establish the mechanisms. OK, so using this survey data, we find the following. Um, so first, uh, the panel on the left shows responses to um, us asking how influential specific citations were on the authors. Um, so we find that most citations, the authors kind of straightforwardly report had little to no influence on their choices. Um, we, uh, the answer choices were relatively concrete. So if you chose, if you marked citation as one, it means the paper would have been very similar without this reference um, and all the way up to five where it motivated the entire project. Um, so, okay, this is maybe not super shocking. Most citations don't reflect much or perhaps any influence. Okay, that's uh, sort of been shown in the literature, but. The maybe more surprising aspect is the panel on the right showing that the more um, highly cited the paper is, that's on the x-axis citations, the more likely it is to be meaningful, right? The more likely it is to reflect substantive influence on the author, right? That's kind of the opposite of the sort of like persuasion by name dropping expectation, right? So indeed it's the more obscure papers that are kind of being cited more sort of uh, uh, superficially. Why is that? Okay, so one um, mechanism uh, is about status. And so what we, in the survey, what we did is we, uh, as people were taking it, we assigned them to receive one of two forms of the survey. And the forms were exactly identical, except if you were assigned to treatment, as you were taking the survey, one of the screens would show you the, your reference, the abstract, blah, blah, blah and also tell you that the paper has been cited X many times and it ranks and Y percent of the distribution, right? So we gave you a little status signal about the paper. Um, and what we found was that this little status signal, which I personally expected to have no effects, actually changed people's perceptions of the paper. Um, in fact, showing low citations count, low citation counts, um, causally lowered people's perceptions of the quality of the paper. That's what you see here in the top row. Uh, the treatment people are the red curve, the control people are the gray curve. And so again, like emphasizing citation counts exaggerated the underlying differences in quality. Um, 
Furthermore, um, more highly cited papers and kind of papers that are perceived to be better um, were discovered earlier in the process of, of the project and read more carefully, right? So there's this kind of path dependence where once you, if you're famous, people assume you're better, your papers better, read you more closely, and kind of inevitably become more influenced by you. So to conclude, um, kind of contrary to at least what we expected, and I think maybe expectations in this literature, it's the famous papers that are the most meaningfully cited, uh, the obscure ones less so, um, meaning that famous papers drive kind of people's decisions and the research trinity even more than their kind of great citation counts suggest. And this kind of removes a major threat to validity of bibliometrics. Like if anything, we're underestimating the importance of famous papers. Um, and this is likely to be causal, like the status of high famous papers likely causes them to be more influential. Um, happy to take questions, here's my email. And for more gory details, uh, here's the preprints and the title that's actually a little different from the one I used here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Misha. And our final presenter will be Andrea. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, I have so many hard acts to follow and going last. I appreciate everybody um, staying on time. So my present presentation today will be um, on the Community Scholars Program at Simon Fraser University. Um, which provides access to scholarly research through an online portal, as well as different kinds of training for participants in the program. So individuals working at nonprofits or community organizations are able to apply to participate in the program, and there are 500 spots. Um, the program is a cooperation between Simon Fraser University Library and several other research uh, libraries in British Columbia, British Columbia Canada. Um, funders and publishers that enable research access for people who need it, but would not otherwise purchase journal subscriptions or be able to afford it. So as a postdoctoral research project, I conducted a developmental evaluation of the program and surveyed and interviewed community scholars, or we call them community scholars, but they're participants, about their experiences as being part of the CSP. So this was uh, supervised by Dr. Juan Alperin, and just so you know, SFU, Simon Fraser, is in Vancouver, Canada. So uh, the reason this is a good model, I consider it like a compromise or maybe like baby steps towards um, open science is that there is real demonstrated program and research impact from this, um, uh, from this program. Um, so scholars reported appreciating both personal educational impacts as well as research impacts. So it's not just a portal, but it's also a place where um, participants go for training. They're um, giving research, uh, workshops and, and um, training to be able to uh, find and use research. So um, scholars were able to tap into a research base for successful grant funding, um, applications, participate in legal challenges. They were enabled to enhance their ability to deliver evidence-based programs. Um, and they were also challenged that even though 60% uh, of the community scholars have graduate level education, um, many participants still wanted, uh, expected an interest in receiving further research related education, sort of refresh your courses. And so um, many community scholars um, also indicated that this is kind of filling a gap in their professional development. So it's possible that the community scholars program could grow into community based research education program, which could contribute to the sustainability of the project of uh, the program itself and earlier. Um, I think it was Micah who was talking about um, sort of social impacts. And this is a, a great example of how um, there are real impact, impacts from allowing and enabling community and nonprofit organizations to have access to research. So the other thing that was great about this project or is great, it's, it's still going on, is it creates community practice. So um, conversations during research interviews indicated that community scholars would be interested in participating in um, more activities. So they, um, this community scholars program organized journal club meetings and workshops offered in person and online. Um, I was struck by how similar they were to student seminars, a real rich discussion. Um, and then the essential role of librarians is, in this program can't be um, overstated. Uh, feedback from community scholars confirmed that um, the success requires the administrative, intellectual, and um, customer relationship management provided by the CSP librarians. Um, during the interviews, 
um, especially people who were in remote areas. So there were participants that lived very far away from any library, let alone a research library, who were thankful for this sort of human touch, the human side um, of this uh, really just a portal or a database that they had access to. Because without it, it seems that the transformation of community members could not become, could not um, transform into community scholars. And finally, um, the Community Scholars Program acts as a knowledge bridge. So it's, it's a liaison or a hub between the academic research community and the greater community that could benefit from access to research. Um, as a pilot program, the CSP has proven that it has potential to encourage the flow of knowledge between the many worlds of professional scholars, community scholars, frontline service deliverers, um, community and nonprofit management, policy, and citizens. And finally, the CSP acts as a bridge between the scholarly publishing world based on a for-profit model and a public good model for access to knowledge. Um, even though the CSP is dependent on the willingness of scholarly public publishers to allow for community access, it stands as a living compromise in the world of scholarly publishing, where, where providing public access is controversial and often fraught. At the same time, the CSP provides countless compelling examples of research impact that scholarly publishers have a stake in to promote their role in the research life cycle. And, and one last point is that um, even though this seems like a kind of charity model where uh, publishers allow a certain number of um, subscriptions for um, kind of worthy applicants, um, it is, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, kind of a baby steps where um, it's proves it's proven that the public um, needs and wants access, but can't necessarily afford it. Um, so thank you so much. Well, let's have a virtual round of applause for all of these presentations, which were outstanding. I have made notes on several that I think are immediately actionable. So don't be surprised if you hear me get an email or something. Lots of really good stuff. Um, thanks, everyone. Please, I hope you've been able to make your connections, whether through the chat or, or other means to, to follow up. I hope you continue to enjoy the rest of the conference and I will conclude the meeting on that note. Thank you. Yeah.